Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 23rd of June, and this may be one of the longest videos I ever do. And I want to preface this video by saying that a lot of the stuff I'm going to say over here is still unsubstantiated. A lot of it is not backed up by footage, or enough footage I believe, yet. So a lot of what I'm going to say must be taken with a grain of salt. And I'm going to try my best whenever I say something over here to not say it as a definitive fact, but just to say that a certain source or multiple sources, they allege that to be the case. And then you guys can make of that what you will, but I'm just gonna try to report on that. And also I might do some analysis of what I talk about in this video, but not that much because I wanna just let the facts be known and let what we do know about the situation uh, be spread to a general audience because over the past, I don't know, six, seven hours, there's been so much news. I've been sitting here probably for like five hours just writing down stuff that I've encountered. And I'm gonna show some of what I've compiled to just to like construct a timeline of what's been going on today between the Wagner Group and the Russian Ministry of Defense and by extension, other elements of the Russian establishment, the military industrial complex, the FSB, the National Guard, seeing how all of them are interacting with one another and whether there's actually a coup going on because at the beginning of this, I was very skeptical of the idea that the Wagner Group could be pulling off a coup, but now uh, upon further videos and upon further news breaking as it really starts to become morning in Russia, we're beginning to see more information come out. And right now, as I'm recording this, you can see the time, I think, in the bottom right corner of the screen. That's Eastern time. But uh, it's 6 a.m. in Russia as of this. So if anything happened after 6 a.m., I don't know of it because I only know of what happened before that as I'm recording right now. So I'm only going to talk about that. But I'm sure I'm going to make update videos um, tomorrow about whatever situation is going on. So I'm going to begin from really the start of this feud, which uh, really you could say started about 12 hours ago in earnest. Although the fighting between the Russian Ministry of Defense and the Wagner Group goes back really months now, ever since the formation of the Wagner Group, ever since Prigozhin, he became out as the guy that operates the Wagner Group publicly with that interview with Rybar. And of course, we have the feud that occurred in late May when the Ukrainians were about to lose the entirety of Bakhmut and you know there was like five square kilometers remaining of Ukrainian land in Bakhmut and Prigozhin began releasing videos where he was complaining about the lack of support that he was receiving from the Russian Ministry of Defense, the lack of ammo shipments. That was really the first main beef you could say and that's when um, Wagner threatens to withdraw their men from Bakhmut and he, they were threatening that there would be a Ukrainian counteroffensive and that there was a lot of incompetence in the higher ranks of the Russian military. So f even then, there was conflict brewing, and that could be chalked up to like power struggles between Prigozhin, who's building up his own private military company that's doing a lot of the work of the Russian Ministry of Defense better than they can do it, given the fact that they had success in Papasnaya and in Bakhmut. And then you have the Russian Ministry of Defense, and their interest is, of course, um, to make sure that the Wagner Group is um, subordinate to them into their orders. And so once Bakhmut was taken, there was a gradual transition of the Wagner forces leaving Bakhmut and going to the rear. They have bases, you know, in Popasnaya. They have bases in Belgorod. And so they were around there recuperating for about a month since, uh, since the fall of Bakhmut on May 20th. And then the Russian regular army, they took over the ranks in Bakhmut. And so since the Zaporozhye counteroffensive started 20 days ago, we really didn't hear much from Prigozhin, which is pretty interesting. We only heard of him for the first time a few days ago in my previous videos where I was talking about the situation in Zaporozhye, and we heard from Prigozhin that the Ukrainians were attacking the direction of Robotinia and that they were able to take over the northern part of it. And at the time, I was sort of doubting what he was saying and um, trying to say that he was trying to basically cast doubt as to uh, to Russia's military capabilities into the regular army, his military capabilities and their ability to defend. But that seemed a bit random that he would just come up with those statements out of nowhere after being quiet for a few weeks. But then 
on the afternoon of the 23rd of June, when it's the afternoon, I mean in uh, Moscow time, so seven hours ahead of Eastern time. So on the afternoon of the 23rd, Prigozhin, he released an interview, and in it he explains how, in essence, the justification that the Russian Ministry of Defense provided for the special military operation into Ukraine was basically BS, and he said that the Russians, they didn't really care about the Donbass, that the Ukrainians never were really hitting civilians in Donbass, only military targets, and that the Russians, they don't care about their own POWs, they care more about plundering Ukraine and Donbass. This is what he said. He said that they didn't care about demilitarizing the Nazification of Ukraine because they traded um, a corrupt official that was allied with Putin and with the Ministry of Defense for Azov soldiers that would have been considered Nazis. So that's the allegation that he was making. He was basically undermining the entire uh, reason for even having an SMO in the first place and casting doubt as to the importance of having one and whether it was all aligned in the first place. So that was really out of character for him because Prigozhin is usually the guy that's the more hardline guy, the much of more of a hardliner who wants to actually escalate the conflict, but instead in that video he was doubting it in the first place. Now, after that Prigozhin, he wrote a statement to the investigative committee of the Russian Federation alleging that uh, Shrigu, Ministry of Defense, and Gerasimov, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Russian Federation, committed genocide against the people of Russia, and that would probably be for their incompetence and bad decision-making in the war that led to high Russian casualties. And so, at around 9 p.m. on uh, June 23rd, Moscow time, the Wagner Group, and, you know, they have a lot of affiliated channels. So when I say Wagner Group, it's not just one channel. There's multiple Telegram channels that are associated with Wagner that do have connections to what's going on over there. And so I just consider it official statements. And they posted that the Russian Ministry of Defense launched an attack on a Wagner rear base. So the Russian Ministry of Defense was explicitly blamed and a video was released as well showing the damage that was done to this Wagner rear base. And I don't know the location of this base, but it seems like it was around the Bhumut area, a bit to the east of it. And it was alleged that there were some Wagner losses as a result. And so at the same time, Prigozhin also released his own audio where he announced the elimination uh, he was announcing basically the elimination of, quote, evil in the face of the country's military leadership. And he said that he would go about a restoration of justice. And he said explicitly, what I'm about to do is not a coup, but he said that he's going to go about something called the restoration of justice, whatever that means to him. That only after that restoration of justice, the Wagner Group will return to its combat missions on the front lines against Ukraine. And so this is really the crux of the beginning of this drama. And in response to this, the Russian media reported that the Russian National Anti-Terrorism Committee, uh, in, in essence, demanded that Wagner stop illegal actions and they opened up a criminal case on a suspected armed rebellion that was being launched by Prigozhin. And they basically rebuffed all of his previous statements. And here's the full message from Prigozhin, where he basically declared a war on the Ministry of Defense. And then here we have uh, Rybar reporting that the Russian Ministry of Justice announced that they will be adding the leader of Wagner PMC, Prigozhin, to the list of foreign agents. So that tells you that, first of all, that the Russian government viewed him as a threat, especially the Ministry of Defense, in that this is actually a serious matter. That, that Those were really the first signs of that. Now we know for sure that there's something bigger going on, but let's move on to something that I found to be pretty interesting, which was the fact that the stock markets, the stock exchange in Russia really plummeted after that announcement from Prigozhin and the announcements from the uh, Russian Court of Justice, which does indicate that a lot of these investors with inside information, they seriously knew of a threat and they were aware of the possibility of things going south from the beginning. And so that's why you saw the stock exchange plummeting every single company's shares going down. But yeah, by uh, midnight, the Prigozhin, he was posting even more 
audio videos, uh, not videos, audios, saying that a large chunk of the Russian army actually supports him and that they probably would defect him. And then in response to these events, the Moscow Stock Exchange uh, decreased, as I said before. And this is when you begin to see a response from the Russian side. And when I say Russian side, I mean Russian Ministry of Defense, FSB, National Guard, all of these affiliated organizations. And so what we began to see is that the National Guard, was Guardia, was put on high alerts and they were put on a mobilization status. They received orders from the MOD to mobilize and they were there were rumors spread that the National Guard was sent to the Wagner office in St. Petersburg. But we don't know if that's true because there were videos on the ground that showed that there was a lack of activity in the area. But nonetheless, we know that there was a Russian response to the statements put out by Prigozhin. And they basically launched something uh, called Planned Fortress. This was a plan by the Russian Ministry of Defense and the internal police to basically set up roadblocks, checkpoints on key parts of highways to set up key... Uh, defenses in certain areas to beef up security in places that would be attacked by an external threat and so that tells you that they were uh, preparing for the worst and this also means that they were preparing for emergency measures and the uh, BBC Russia channel they stated that the FSB and the SOBR National Guard unit were establishing roadblocks along the entirety of the Moscow Foreignage Rostov on Don Highway let me show you guys a highway just so you get an idea of where this was all going on. So over here you have Rostov on Don. Here you have um, Shakhti, which is another city close to the border with um, formerly what was Ukrainian territory. You have to the north Pavlovsk and then even further to the north if you go out you have Voronezh, a regional capital, and then Lipetsk. And then if you go even more up, that's when you reach Moscow, very far away from the entire drama. But there is a singular highway that's connecting all of them. And that one is the M4 highway. This is where a lot of the roadblocks were set up. There were roadblocks set up around Rostov on the outskirts, around the airport, around the Southern Military Headquarters building. And so from the beginning of uh from the midnight basically and the subsequent hours really you didn't see reports of any fighting and we did see reports of roadblocks being closed off we saw videos of russian convoys that were stationed at these different parts of the highway and they were just manning the area manning the perimeter around the city around the outskirts of the city at night not many reports of gunfire at that point but this began to change when the Wagner Telegram channel, they posted that anyone from the Russian Ministry of Defense who hadn't yet joined Prigozhin's cleansing campaign would be dealt with accordingly if they didn't change their ways. And let me see, I think this is the statement itself. You can see, uh, all military personnel of the armed forces of the Russian Federation who do not want to join the cleansing campaign will be considered collaborators and will be dealt with accordingly. And so that is a pretty clear threat which involves a uh, physical force, and that was already an indication of what Wagner would go on to do in a few hours. So at that point, there was an, uh, a video announced, uh, leaked by Sergei Servikin, who was previously the head of the SMO from October to January, I believe, and he actually had very cordial relations with Prigozhin, which is why what's about to happen next came as a bit of a surprise to me. But so Ravikin, he basically tried to make the case to Prigozhin to lay down his arms and find a settlement with the Ministry of Defense. So he is actually currently the liaison between the Wagner Group and the Ministry of Defense. That was his role to try to basically improve relations. Clearly he failed at that. But here he's just making a last case and you could also see in his hand he's holding this gun with a silencer. Not the best look for him. And um, he says here something about leave your uh, leave the columns, return them. That is word for word what he said, leave the columns, return them. So that was an indication that the Wagner Group had columns in the direction of the 
actual borders of Russia proper, at those Wagner Group columns that were initially on the rear in Ukraine, not on the front line, but in the rear, like Donetsk, Luhansk, maybe even Belgorod, that those columns were regrouping and they were making their way across the highways, crossing the border from Ukraine into Russia in the direction of Rostov. That was a major indication that that is what the Wagner Group was going to do. And that was sort of what, what Servikin basically said here is a last ditch attempt at trying to prevent that. But even Servikin, who was very respected by Prigozhin, uh, he was basically mentioned as the only competent general in the Russian military by Prigozhin. Even his words were not enough to dissuade him, to dissuade Prigozhin. And what was said afterwards is that the um, Wagner Group. Uh, said that Surovikin will not be able to stop what has already started. That's basically what the Wagner Group said. Then by 1 a.m. videos of the National Guard of the Russian Federation popped up. They were erecting checkpoints and barriers near the Kremlin and the State Duma. And at the same time, the Wagner Group was calling on members of the National Guard to join them. So this is when the situation really began to heat up with Russians preparing, beefing up their defensive sense of defenses. Here's a video. This At this time... Rostov was still under control of Russian troops of the National Guard. You can see the videos over here. These are a few hours ago, around 1 a.m. And here you can see reports from that time of traffic jams and road closures on the M4 highway to the north of Rostov and around Shakhti as well, another major city in the region. You can see all of these, like, these red... Um, signs, these red circles indicating traffic jams. You could also see the red lines over here which show there were major closures to the northeast of Rostov and then also around Shakhti there were major closures at different intersections leading into those respective cities and so that was already a sign that the Russians were preparing for armored columns advancing in the direction of both cities and so by 2 a.m. Prigozhin, he said that he had entered the region of Rostov and urged Russian Ministry of Defense conscripts that were stationed at these checkpoints that I have mapped over here, or that this guy has mapped over here. I'll link all of these um, tweets in the description. He urged all of them, basically, to not resist what the Wagner Group was about to embark upon and said that the Wagner Group crossed the Russian state border and that as the Wagner Group was crossing the border back into Russia, the border guards hugged him and let him in. And he says that he doesn't want to fight the 18-year-old boys that were sent to man the different checkpoints that were set up during planned fortress. And that Wagner will destroy anything that comes in their way if need be. Which is, again, another threat to the Russian Ministry of Defense saying, if you interfere with what we're about to do, sending in these comms to these major cities, then we will not hesitate to strike you guys. And in contrast to this war of words that was mainly directed by Prigozhin, at the time, around 2 a.m., I was looking at all the local telegram channels from Rostov, and they were reporting that there was no major disturbances at the city of Rostov, not even the region of Rostov, let alone the uh, border over here, the border between Ukraine and Russia. They reported a total lack of gunfire or anything like that, but they did notice that there was a significant amount of road closures, so that was what they found to be the most notable thing that was occurring in the early morning. But um, then by 3.30 a.m., Prigozhin, he announced um, another post where uh, he basically said, uh, I'll actually open it up if I have it over here. I hope I do. Let me see. I might not have it open, but in essence, what he was saying is that um, the, the mistake of any African dictator is to deal airstrikes at civilian areas. And right now, in the air, there are two planes, number 523 and 546, dealing airstrikes. And so that means that there were two Russian planes that were flying over his columns and trying to attack them. That was his allegation. And at the same time, there was videos released of armored columns along the M4 highway that were probably of the um, Russian National Guard. Here we have a column of Russian National Guard tanks spotted on the highway to the north of the Rostov uh, on Dar City. 
and he says uh, Prigozhin claimed that his uh, men crossed the border, as I said before. And now, by 4 a.m., Prigozhin, he claimed that there was a helicopter that was flying over his columns and that they were opening fire. And so in response, he says that the Wagner Group's column, they fired back at the helicopter and shot it down. This claim itself has not been substantiated yet, even though hours have passed by. So there's no evidence of this one, but there's another helicopter that was shot down later. Um, there was an unconfirmed video, though, showing um, what appears to be a helicopter firing at Wagner troops. This can't be confirmed. It was never confirmed, even though it was from a few hours ago. But you can see the video over here. It's very hard to tell what's going on. But with audio, you could hear that it sounds like a helicopter's firing some, some sort of missile. And then in the same area, along the same highway, there's uh, videos of gunfire. Gunfire being heard at the same sort of general area. So them, it does seem like there was some sporadic clashes that began to occur around 3 to 4 a.m. along the highways towards Rostov. And then really the situation escalated even further by 5 a.m. when videos began getting posted by Rostov residents themselves about convoys driving around within the city itself. Let's go to that. So here we have this video. You could see that all of these civilians they are just standing by downtown Rostov as men are walking around with guns in their hands, with tanks pointed at certain buildings, with armored columns and trucks unloading people, and everyone's just recording it. And the thing that's interesting is that at the same time, there was the Russian Air Force spotted above the Rostov region. There's videos of that as well. And there's videos showing the uh, Russian columns. We don't know whether it was Wagner or Russian military, but these columns are driving across downtown Rostov. And there were tanks and armored vehicles there. And there was a big debate at the time as to whether those were Wagner Group's forces that had finally reached the city of Rostov itself, or whether it was the National Guard, or whether it was FSB or police that were trying to man the perimeter and trying to defend against the Wagner group that they anticipated would reach Rostov at some point. There is a third theory that perhaps there were uh, National Guards men filmed in these videos, but that they had defected to the Wagner group and were trying to help them in taking it over. So those were some of the rumors at the time. But um, at the same time, there's dozens of photos and videos that were uncovered showing men walking around certain buildings within Rostov that are of particular significance. I'm just going to show some of those photos and then I'm going to go to the map to show the targets that are most important. Where you can see all these men that were photoed. And you can see their, their guns are aiming at a certain building, which does show that they're in more of an attacking mood, trying to surround a certain perimeter uh, trying to encircle it perhaps instead of trying to defend because if they were defending they would be pushing outside of Rostov not inwards into Rostov you know and so um, there's a something very interesting that was posted I want to see if I could find it actually but there were um, basically confirmations by 5 a.m. that the Wagner group was able to penetrate the city of Rostov and that their own armored columns were able to reach the city itself. And there is a video here of a pair of Wagner T-80BVs pointing their main guns at the Russian Southern Military District headquarters in Rostov, which just showed that they were able to reach the center of the city without much of a fight. And that at that point, they began to aim their guns at the district headquarters itself. So let's go to the map and see the district headquarters. This headquarters is home to the command of the entire Southern Military District, but it's also an area where there's a lot of coordination for the special military operation in Ukraine. And so this is a major command center that gives orders to the units that are fighting on the front line. So it's incredibly important that there is communication between the Russian uh, positions and the Russian proper and then the front line. And if Wagner Group is there, which they are, we know, 
and that has de definitely disrupted the flow of communications. Also, Rostov is a key supply hub. A lot of roads and a lot of rail lines, they come in through here and then they go into Donetsk or even into Luhansk. And so you need to have control over Rostov in order to continue to supply the men at the front line. And so now that the Latin group has control over Rostov, that is made a much more peculiar situation for the front line. It will make it much more difficult for the Russians to go on the attack now. It will make it much more difficult for them to even try to defend if they can't get more shipments. So let's look at some of the buildings over here that were um, alleged to have been taken over where you had men that were being dropped off from trucks and surrounding these buildings. Of course, we have the Southern Military District building. There's also here uh, troops operating around the perimeter of the Ministry of the Interior building. And so this building was also surrounded and we don't have video from inside, but perhaps they stormed it and took it over from the inside. And I don't think there was even a fight because there were no reports of major gutter fire within the city center, even though there were maybe hundreds of men with tanks rolling around the streets over there. And so by 5.17, Fergusian announced that the Wagner group had shot down another helicopter on the Moscow Highway and that there was actually some footage of that that was posted, but that's less important. The thing that's the most important is that the Wagner group confirmed that they had control over the city of Rostov and over key buildings within Rostov. And so they actually had a list of several buildings that they were able to take over. So they were able to take over, as I said before, the military district, so the military district headquarters, and also the Ministry of Internal Affairs building. They were able to take over the police department building. They were able to take over the local administration, uh, city council building. They were able to take over the local police department building, uh, local F FSB building. So all these key buildings that you need in order to coordinate a control and project power over this area were all taken over really without much of a fight by the Wagner group. And we do know that from previous hours, there were National Guardsmen maining the perimeter around Rostov. So then th this begs the question, what happened to them? Did they just retreat? Did they defect? Some of them probably defected. That's what Prigozhin was saying, that they defected. And it makes sense because there was not much of a fight but others may have retreated further to the east, maybe to the north along the M4 highway towards the um, oblast of uh, Voronezh, which is uh, a bit to the north, borders Luhansk. But um, we do know that it was probably Wagner that took this area over. From reports on the ground, there's actually a journalist that was covering the situation. She posted about it. Her name is... Alina Lip, and she said that she talked to the men there and they confirmed that they were Wagner. There were some patches that were caught on camera that looked like they were National Guardsmen. So it's possible that some of them defected or that they initially held positions within Rostov but had to withdraw. Here's just some more of those photos again of the situation. But uh, here's another video of the crash site, crash site where you had the second helicopter shut down. This is what Prigozhin alleged that he was able to shot, uh, shoot down a second helicopter that was attacking his columns. And there's actually a photo provided for this one, so it seems like this actually may have happened. Then here's uh, more footage from earlier, like an hour ago, hour and a half, showing the Wagner Group's tanks that were aimed at the building, the Southern Military District Headquarters building. Seemingly as a threat to whoever was still in there. Perhaps members of the Ministry of Defense were in there and they were forced to vacate due to the threat of being fired at because we don't know, we don't really see anything about tanks firing at the building, so that didn't happen. So, whatever happened there ended up happening peacefully. There was a peaceful takeover in all likelihood. But now the question is, are they going to consolidate their gains in this area or will they continue to push forward? From what we're seeing, there's new reports from around 6 a.m. that the uh, Russians, the Wagner group specifically, are pushing in the direction of Voronezh along the M4 highway, the same highway that connects Rostov-on-Don to the Voronezh Oblast. 
and that there was actually a shooting on a highway over there in the region. So here's a video of that. Because if you listen to the audio, you'd hear the gunfire. And there is a geolocated image um, 350 kilometers north of Rostov in Voronezh Oblast. It appears that a separate group of Wagner forces are pushing north of the M4 highway, engaging the Russian forces in the town of Fobolovsk. And it was geolocated. So let's go to that, actually. So that's over here. And you can see that it's actually pretty close to Voronezh. It shows the speed at which the Wagner columns have been able to cross the border and have been able to take over key cities. And also the lack of resistance. Where are these checkpoints? Why are they not stopping the Wagner group? We do know, though, that as of the recording of this video, there are clashes that are starting to occur to the south of Voronezh as the Russian forces in this area appear to at least be trying to offer some resistance there. So there is some gunfire as reported in that previous video that I showed. And um, yeah, the situation is very difficult, very tense in this area. A lot of confusion, a lot of confusion for local governors from Voronezh region and also from Lipetsky region. They don't know what's going on. They're panicking. They aren't receiving a a clarification from the higher-ups in the government. Putin, we don't know his status right now. A few hours ago, right before midnight, there was a video of his motorcade, and they entered the Kremlin. And that was probably so he could, you know, command the situation and try to get a better understanding and come to a certain decision. But we haven't heard anything from him before uh, since then. We only heard from his spokespersons, but not from him directly. It's, it's very interesting to see what's going on here because Putin actually had a pretty good uh, cordial relationship with um, Prigozhin and Prigozhin, he never actually explicitly called out Putin in any of his videos I released or he was very, very disrespectful to other military commanders and to other leaders, but never to Putin himself. And so it's very difficult to say whether this operation by Wagner is directed at Putin or whether it's directed at, you know, the Ministry of Defense. To me, I, I'm leaning towards the latter right now because I know that Putin is a very popular figure over there and that although Prigozhin has developed his own following in recent months, he's still not at the same level as Putin. Putin is still more popular and you can't just throw him under the bus like that. And it would also undermine his narrative that he's uh, trying that... This is not a coup, but just a cleansing operation. And so over the next hours, I would just recommend that you guys look out, first of all, for the actions of Putin if he does end up doing something. Because, you know, he does still have control over most of the country, over 99% of the country still has control over all of the major cities, um, nuclear capabilities, and over most of the elites, I would believe, still have confidence in him, although some may be jumping over to Prigozhin. And he does still have the confidence of most of the National Guard, most of the regular military, although a lot of them are in Ukraine right now, which may present another issue for Russia. How can they defend against Wagner when they're pushing deep into Russia if they have to defend against the Ukrainian counteroffensives? So that's another issue Russia's going to have to deal with. But also, you know, the... Putin, he still has the support of the FSB, for the most part, the local police, and of the Spetsnaz units. So that might not last forever. That might not last forever. So he needs to make of it the most that he can in the moment in order to restore unity. He has to make a public statement. You know, something that happened after the attempt at cooing Hitler, uh, I think it was right after D-Day. In 1944, there was that plot to kill Hitler, and it was organized by the British and everything, and it nearly succeeded, but then Hitler survived, and there was a lot of panic in Russia, and uh, Germany, Nazi Germany, and a lot of uh, potential, uh, potential for German elites and German generals to take over for Hitler, so then Hitler he cleared the airwaves, he made statements to the public to inform them that he was still alive and that the situation was under control. That's something that Putin needs to do. I know that Putin is not the main enemy 
that Prigozhin has at least publicly directed his anger at, but regardless of what he feels of the situation, he's put in a position where he has to respond because Russia, he, he's in charge of it. It's This is his sovereign country. He can't just let this man go around taking over different cities within his own country, you know? And we know that now the Russian media is reporting that Prigozhin is going to face a sentence of up to 20 years in prison if he's actually captured, and that Putin's being actively informed of the situation as it's unfolding, but nonetheless, he's not making any public statements. We haven't heard him even come up with any sort of executive decrees that have been publicly announced just yet. So I am very interested to see where he falls with all the loyalties between the Ministry of Defense, Shuigu, Jurassimo, Wagner, the National Guard, because now, you know, a lot of the National Guard is defecting. A lot of them in Rostov and are defecting. And not a single shot has been fired in um, in Rostov yet, which is just crazy. We'll have to see if that continues deeper into Russia. So I'll keep you guys informed. Uh, sorry if this video was a bit um, off the cuff. And I'm just very tired of spending hours reading all the reports and trying to compile all of this. And I've been talking now for like 40 minutes. So uh, I apologize if I have to stop at some points just to like think for a moment. But yeah, that's all for today. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.